New York CEO Adam Newman announcing he is stepping down, although he will retain his chairman title. Deirdre Bosa with the latest details. Deirdre. Sarah Newman deciding that the scrutiny directed toward him had become too much of a distraction. So now CFO Artie Minson, Vice Chairman Sebastian Gunningham, a former Amazon executive, they take over as co-CEOs. And, well, guys, they have their work cut out for them. WeWork still needs more money, but is no closer to an IPO. And a big part of WeWork was Newman's success. It was built on his charisma. At the start of the year, he told me that it took just 28 minutes for Masasan to make the decision to invest. Have a listen. The first thing I'll say about the relationship is I think a partnership gets measured by when times are, I don't want to use di difficult because, again, ten, nothing about this is difficult, but when things change. And something beautiful about Masters and my relationship is how we communicate. Now, it didn't take very long for that relationship to turn troubled as WeWork became a liability for Masa and SoftBank. Guys, now that Newman's gone, does that change the picture? I think there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered. Back to you. Deirdre, thanks so much for that. Uh, let's bring in Jeff Sonnenfeld, Senior Associate uh, Dean for Leadership Studies at Yale School of Management, uh, to get his take. Uh, hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Uh, main question. Good, Wolf. How are you? Uh, uh, very well as well, thanks. Main question, I think, is how surprised you are and how significant you think it is that he also uh, diluted his voting power. Well, you know, uh, I, people are supposed to say I hate to be and I told you so, but I love to be and I told you so. I've been saying this for over two years and, and on air here quite frequently, that this, this house of cards was coming down. This is a, a, a failure in misunderstanding what the marketplace is for this um, 20-something uh, business based on beanbags, distressed furniture, and Nespresso machines. Uh, there's no technology <laughs> here. Uh, and, and the governance model is so badly flawed. And the strategy itself, there are people in this business, and we've talked about those players before, that have uh, significant, comfortable businesses. This is not a new business. Uh, Servcorp out of Australia created this exact business 40 years ago, very profitable in 38 cities. And, of course, we've talked about IWG, uh, the, the old Regis model, which is in 70 more countries than Adam Newman's perhaps ever visited, and way more uh, in size and scale than, than, than WeWorks is in terms of their sprawl. Uh, and, and yet, uh, somehow, this guy has been treated as some guru genius because he's such an effective self-promoter. So, Jeffrey, you know every single CEO on the planet. Who should take this job? I love that question. You know, I, I know we probably only have a few minutes, but I'd love to take the next half hour until we hear from Nancy Pelosi and what's <laughs> happening on the next topic of the day. Because right, we'll they're actually... Minutes. <laughs> okay, is uh, they've got very two very good people in there as co-CEOs. These co-CEO models generally fail. There are a couple of examples at, at Oracle and, and, and Bridgewater, a few places where it, in fact, uh, does work. Uh, in this case, they're there strictly as an interim model. Neither one of these guys has been a CEO before. They've been stabilizers for charismatic types. Who is there out there? Well, somebody who's very close to Matsuyoshi Son, uh, very close to the SoftBank people, trusted, loved by them who's all dressed up and ready to go pretty soon is John Ledger. Yes, you heard it here first. Uh, I think there's some rumors out there that are starting to spread that he's the perfect guy for the job. He actually, people forget, after he left Dell, where he was really successful uh, in Asia and all, all parts of the developing world, he went in and turned around the, the, the legacy, the carcass of Global Crossing after a much worse scandal than this, uh, the implosion there. All the underwater cables and things are very puffed up. A giant governance and strategy scandal. John did an amazing job, and he's been very good, actually, at revivals and resuscitations before he went off over to build. Uh, T-Mobile, he came in there. It was a disaster after the AT&T deal had collapsed. John came in, and he built up value that was enormous there, that people thought, well, there was an effort for uh, the Sprint to buy them, that Matsuyoshi son wanted to do that back, I think, in 2013 or so. And, and T-Mobile was so much smaller. T-Mobile dwarfs them now. They've been growing at 40% a year. Glassdoor tops out uh, always. Would he take uh, it, though, Jeffrey? You know, uh, I think he shouldn't, but I think he would. Uh, I, I would have thought he should wait for Elon Musk's job uh, because at least there's a there there. There's a real technology. But John would know how to shape something out of this. Plus, as you've been seeing and reading out to us that 
we're looking at perhaps maybe up to a third of the workforce being dismissed pretty soon. They've got 12,000 people, and we're already talking about possibly 4,000 pink slips coming out. John knows how to come into a demoralized culture and really build spirit, build energy. He's been a leader in the diversity front. Uh, he, 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 it, it would be crazy for Matsuyoshi's son to not talk John into taking this job. Whatever it takes, make him another billionaire. Maybe he already is one, but make him a multi-billionaire. John wouldn't really know how to do this. He is, he is energized. He's, he's just as inspiring. But he's honest and smart. I'm outspoken and likes to go after critics. There's a good Wall Street Journal profile of him, actually, from a few weeks ago, on the success he's had in his sort of unique management style. Uh, oh, just a quick absolutely. final question. Je Jeffrey, where, where do you stand on how much blame falls at the feet of uh, the head of the investment banks that were backing the original version of, of the S1? They sh you know, there's an old Beatles song. Uh, I think it was uh, the flip side of, uh, of Hard Day's Night that said, I should have known better. Uh, at the, that was uh, probably uh, 1963, 64, 64, is th that's what they should be singing. These investment banks should have known better. We've seen people fall victims to these charismatic types before, whether or not it was, you know, Lululemon or uh, American Apparel or, of course, Theranos. And uh, sophisticated people sometimes are fall victim, very sophisticated people, the ones who get snookered in these art frauds all the time, and they don't want to admit it, but they're just the uh, same... Uh, 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 susceptible flesh and bones as the rest of us, and they make mistakes. And these investment banks should have asked some questions. And you know, uh, P.T. Barnum is supposed to have said, although nobody can prove he actually said it, there's a sucker born every minute. That's what's going on here. And Wall Street, I hate to admit it, Wilf, uh, they were suckered too, along with, with SoftBank buying in. Where did they get this $47 billion for $12 billion of cash? You look at their S1 and you can see they have $47 billion of long-term lease commitments. And you know what, uh, three and a half or you know, not $4 billion of, of the short-term leases to try to cover it. They, the $47 billion was, was a, a number out of the sky to try to meet where their commitments are. And for, the, for Wall Street to not even realize that, when it goes into the S1 that they're printing, that's just crazy.